All right, this first drawing is of a llama. Uh, I'm doing this on a 140 pound watercolor paper. Um, I believe it's the Union Square paper. Uh, this is being done with the Pigma Microns. I think it's a 0.5 pen. Um, basically, this is this is being done with no underdrawing in pencil beneath it. So it's a little, what I call scritchy scratchy. Um, you can see some kind of basic lines. I'm trying to draw very light uh, just to find that form. Um, this is something where this is actually what I t typically tend to call just a sketch. This is not a finished drawing. This is just taking an image, um, kind of finding the form loosely um, and quickly, doing the shading. Uh, this is not like a, a super intense, you know, hours and hours of work figure drawing or, or you know, animal drawing. Um, Basically, I find that form first. You can see I'm starting to shade kind of in the back of, uh, of his neck, then going into his ear. When I'm doing this with these larger blocks of shading, I tend to follow the same pattern as kind of the hair falls. You don't need to do it where it's every single little hair in place. Actually, that's sometimes a really bad idea. Uh, that's the quickest way for people to note inconsistencies in your work and kind of where something doesn't look right if it's kind of every single hair in place. You want to do kind of a generalized form with that to be able to um, allow the viewer to actually kind of subconsciously read that as fur without giving them every single little hair. Uh, that's good kind of just across the board in in all animal work. Um, I'm going in, you can notice as I'm going into the mouth and kind of under the chin and down you know, further, if I'm not following the hairline, I'm actually doing the hatching at an angle, kind of a upper left to lower right angle. Why I do that, I don't know. I think it's just kind of a, from being left-handed, it's the easiest way to work and the way that I can control the line the fastest, kind of where my hand strength is. Um, so that's kind of always the way that I work. Um, with this, just continuing to kind of tighten that shadow, going up into the ear. You notice that I kind of jump around a lot as I'm working. Um, that's a twofold reason for that. Part of it is to be able to kind of work in different areas and bring them up kind of all together at the same time. Another part is if I'm kind of working in a, a place and I really don't know what to do, like I keep kind of coming back to that nose and deciding not to, um, I kind of go somewhere else for a little while while I think about it. Um, now the eye, you'll notice when I went in there, the first thing I outlined was where I want that highlight to be. Always give yourself more highlight than you need uh, because this is permanent ink pen. You can't go back and erase it back out. You can always make it smaller later. Um, and then I find kind of that form of the eye. Make sure that you put that shadow in. That really makes it believable with that highlight and that shadow and then the darkness of kind of the pupil and the outline. Uh, it gives it that 3D effect with very little effort. And it kind of also gives you the finished point of this is about where the finishing kind of part of my drawing is going to be. Now I need to bring everything else up to that level. Um, so you can see there kind of that I was talking about the, the angled shading, but also kind of giving that hairline. You, uh, if you look at the face, his hair is much shorter on his real face than I'm making it in the drawing. But it's nobody's going to see that photograph. So it's it's just kind of using that hair as, as a shading kind of tool and uh, just to, he's fuzzy. So um, this is the part that I kind of didn't like as much dealing with kind of how I was gonna do the nose. So you can see it, me kind of jump around and try to get some shades in here and there. Um, it helps to kind of go across it and work it as a big giant unit and then kind of make your decisions as you go. Um, it, it, for some reason that's how problem solving with working in ink works for me. It's a little easier that way. You can look at this and see that everything is not absolutely perfectly proportionate like the picture of the llama is, um, which sometimes as you're shading, it starts becoming more apparent and more proportionate. Um, it's okay for it not to look exact. Uh, the best thing you can do is draw lots and lots and lots like this. Um, get the practice in. They don't have to be even this tight with all this really tight shading. While you're learning to do the pen, it's okay to to make them looser and you know less defined. Um, and just kind of to teach yourself how to actually draw with that tool um, and work with it. You can see me going back in. I'm trying to find some darker darks, kind of balancing it out. Uh, when you're doing this, it helps to squint and look at the animal and the photograph. 
uh, then you can make sure it kind of gives you that idea of are these gray values in touch where it actually makes it 3D? Does it make it fall away? Can you see the contours and the form of the animal that I, you know, you're drawing? Um, squint every so often then you can see okay no that looks too flat go back in and do some shading sometimes you have to shade a little bit more than maybe the animal really is sometimes you can shade less so um, kind of use that tool anytime you're working with uh, color or black and white like this it, it helps um, especially with color because sometimes color can all be the same gray value but different colors and you don't realize it if you don't squint so we'll, we'll look at that on one of the color works in just a little bit um, just tightening up kind of all those areas going back in after squinting kind of trying to decide you know where it needs a little bit darker here and there a little bit more contour um, a little shading in the white just to kind of join the two so it's not just you know these dark shadows in the spots signed and it's done this fox is being done on Stonehenge paper uh, it is a 100% cotton rag paper. It's, it's actually called craft paper. Um, we're using the Jumbo Jet Jerry's pencils, the black, um, and then all of the, the earth tones and the white pencil, the four that are in that line. And the uh, image, just like the image of the llama, is from Pixabay, which is a free use, um, royalty free, and um, copyright free website. It's a good place to get animal photos from for free that are really awesome to work. Um, then you can sell your work and there's no copyright infringements. What I'm doing here is finding the form with kind of doing my underdrawing with that pencil that most closely matches that toned paper. Um, the reason for that is twofold. What you're getting is something that's very close, so it stands out just enough you can see it, but not so much where it's going to be an issue where if you make a few little mistakes, it's, it's going to stand out kind of in the finished work. Um, some people try to use graphite with that. I don't suggest that um, tone paper. Use the pencils that you're actually going to use because the graphite will smear and smudge and is silvery and it will cause mayhem in your work. So I don't recommend that. Um, now that I've got that drawing in there in that earth tone, I am um, going in kind of with the dark brown. I'm not the black yet. I'm finding kind of where my darker areas are going to be, going ahead and getting those kind of set in so that I can basically take that drawing and make it a little tighter and a little tighter kind of with each color application that I do. This is where you want to, as you're doing this, I'm kind of working in, in areas and sections this is where you want to kind of cement how your drawing looks. Uh, if there's problems at this point, this is where you need to correct it. Um, walk away sometimes if you need to, come back, look at it with a fresh eye before you move on to the area where you really start applying color because a, a lot of times you are so vested in that drawing, you're not gonna wanna take a break and, and go and then you come back and then there's huge mistakes and it's going to be very difficult to take those off. So. Um, so if you kind of work in layers in the next color and then the next color, this is easier without getting to that black where if you do need to erase something, it's not going to be a process. It's not going to, uh, you know, be something very dark and hard to remove. Uh, and with this, you'll notice I, I sharpen through this a lot. Keep those pencil leads very, very sharp. Um, I'm not just coloring. I'm actually doing kind of hatching as I work with this. Those are all like little lines. They're not just kind of smudges and scribbles. So I want that super duper sharp so I've got decent control with uh, the drawing. All right, now that I've gotten my kind of drawing in, I've made sure kind of the lights and the darks are, are gently laid in where I, I'm pretty sure this is how I wanna go with this drawing. I'm going in with the dark pencil. Uh, the first thing I'm gonna do is find my darkest darks, which is usually the eyes. Um, also, when you do the eyes, it make, gives you that feeling of, Oh, look there's a part that's actually come together because drawings paintings everything go through ugly stages where you feel bad and you don't think it's it's going well so getting those eyes in kind of always gives me that oh okay this is going to be all right um but with these darkest darks i'm kind of laying out this is as dark as this is going to be all these other dark points need to match up with this uh, when i get done with the darks then i'll be going in with the lightest parts and saying these are my lightest lights this is what i have to match up with so then it's kind of that balance and play of the in-between. 
Um, that's what's beautiful about using paper like this, where it's a toned ground. Um, you could use grays, you could use, you know, browns, you could use some warmer colors and make it kind of a little more contemporary. You know, a violet or a, even a nice, you know, pale orange would have been cool with this. Um, anywhere that you can use that, it, it helps you have to use kind of as much color because the paper actually fills in for some of that. Um, and then kind of it does some of the work so then your lights and darks are kind of more the the emphasis for the drawing so you can see I got that white how I wanted it kind of up under his cheeks under his muzzle um, now I'm going in to start kind of determining how black I want these legs to be um, I'll be going over that and doing that I actually think I went over it three times because uh, once I got all the legs done I didn't like how they kind of balanced each other out so I went back over it all right, so I've got the rear legs and the tail pretty much where I want it. Um, now I'm going onto the front leg. You notice that brush that my hand is resting on? That's just a goat-haired hockey brush. I've had that thing for decades. It's just kind of what I use as a hand rest. It doesn't damage the paper. It keeps my, um, my skin and oils from my skin off of the paper and keeps me from smudging it as well. Right or left-handed, either way, you've got to work on both sides of your artwork as you go. So it's good to have either a leaning bridge or something like that, uh, where it's going to keep you from kind of rubbing your hand through the paper and the color. Um, so that's kind of, it. people always have a question about what is that. Um, also, uh, a note, that eraser that I'm using is the uh, Breeze 4B eraser. That thing works fantastically with colored pencils and with these oil pencils. These are actually oil-based pencils, so they're usually a lot more difficult to get up off paper, especially a smoother paper um, like this craft paper. Um, and that was something I, I hadn't done this kind of a drawing on craft paper. I usually just do uh, do a, what's called a chiaroscuro with black and white. This paper actually is smooth enough where it does not take as many layers of color like uh, the my teints or something like that would that's got more texture to the paper so um so you have to be really careful with that and then the eraser actually helped pull that off of there if i needed it i could actually take the black off uh, from what i found so that was a great little eraser for that uh, again the sharpening the pencils can't be over reiterated it's it's a good way to keep those kind of crisp lines uh, because there is a difference on that soft paper it gets really mushy um, and flat looking if you don't keep that point. So right here, I'm just finding that form. I'm going in and trying to make the ears not look just like a, you know, a flat area, um, kind of starting in with the red. Here I'm really working towards kind of finding where I want those reddest reds to be on him, um, getting the color laid out and kind of, see that's making a huge difference, that just little bit of red on there. Um, just to kind of see how, how red do I want this, where you can see in the back, kind of over his rump on the sides, it's really getting closer to the color of that photo. Um, just kind of now I'm starting with kind of that push and pull of besides the white and the black, kind of where that red's gonna fit in there, um, but making sure to leave a little bit of the paper kind of showing through, through this area of the white patch kind of up under him. Uh, up under his chin and on his chest, this is the hardest area to kind of be able to determine that play and not overdo it, whether it's either very white or whether it's left normal, just kind of that paper color and looks too flat. And here I've added a few pencils, apparently. Um, actually, these are the, uh, the Caran d'Ache um, colored pencils. The orange was not going to give enough pop. There's some of those highlights kind of around the face where it's a little bit more yellow. There wasn't going to be a way to not make it just look way too, you know, only one color kind of with that orange. So I brought a few colors of those in just with the luminance where I can just put some little touches in that'll give uh, the head a little bit more definition because I realized kind of this far into the drawing, I was not going to find that with just these pencils, although it's a nice range, it's just not quite enough um, to get that, you know, detail and enough definition. All right, so I am going in and doing the highlights on the feet. Um, you can see there, you know, I went in with the brown, there was not any black on the feet. I'm trying to kind of 
push and pull a little bit in to give definitions to the toes so it just doesn't look like you know these weird black socks i'm actually going to leave a little bit more brown than really exists on the feet just to be able to give it kind of a little bit more believable look in the photo i think they've done some color correcting and editing on it um, to give it that you know overly pushed bright color which makes that black then look too flat so I didn't want his feet to disappear on my work um, so that's that's what I was doing there with that now I'm kind of going in and picking out a little bit of red that's in that chest you can see that I've started in with those luminance pencils you can see that little bit more kind of yellow around kind of the rough around his face um, the ears were very challenging here not you know trying to keep them from looking just like little black cardboard cutouts in the ear uh, but still give it enough depth to really kind of show that that hair and that fuzziness and his, you know, very dramatic color. Um, so that's kind of what I'm doing here, just kind of trying to find the play between the, the color, between the value, and, uh, you know, keeping it from looking cardboard cutout-ish. If you've ever done a black cat, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, uh, artwork of black cats is horrible. All right, now I'm doing the definition more around the eye uh, to really get kind of that darker, kind of smokier area um, around his eyes. This part's a little bit tricky because you can't, you can go too dark and really lose his face and you can go not dark enough and really kind of um, lose that, you know, obviously fox-like quality. Uh, he, you don't want to make him look like a raccoon, but at the same, in the same sense, you, you know, with the paper and with kind of the color, you're limited to kind of what you've got here in front of you. Um, so it's just, I'm just kind of going along slowly, kind of really trying to pick and pull and, you know, decide how to give the definition. Notice I just kind of darkened up the eyes slightly. Um, he was starting to look where I, I don't want to lose kind of the shine in his eye in the photo actually you can't see them very well but to me animal portraits are very unbelievable if you don't see some you know color in the iris and you don't see some reflection um, in the eye whether it's in the the photo you're working from or not uh, that just gives kind of that connection with the viewer and for some reason to people it makes it look much more believable uh, so I'm going to continue to kind of work on the smokiness and kind of the sootiness on his face and on the top of his head there. Now I'm going in and kind of working on those highlights again. Um, like, like I said before, this is a, definitely a push-pull kind of, of the lights and the darks. I'm um, even kind of lightening around his eye just so lightly with that little bit of white um, just to define, you can see how much that changes that definition. It really, suddenly his face is becoming three-dimensional. Those highlights really necessarily aren't there on his face with that little bit of light around it. It's slight, but sometimes you have to push that. You have to know as much about what you don't see as what you do see with the color. Sometimes it, the picture is just not going to be enough. Um, so I'm just kind of working along with that back to the darks, back to the lights. It's just that push-pull kind of as you finish. All right, here I'm still kind of working on, on his the top of his head and his nose. Um, the top of his head, I think, was the definitely the hardest part of this drawing, just really trying to not make that look very flat, um, give it enough highlights but not be too much. Uh, that's where that brush comes in handy. I don't know if you saw that. I just cleaned up kind of all my eraser, the little bit of kind of color and dust that had gone around it, cleaned up that. I like how the drawing looks, so I'm putting a little bit of kind of snow in there to ground him. Don't have your animals just floating in space. That doesn't look real to people. Uh, so I've put in the highlights. Now I'm kind of doing that little bit of dark shadow under him, um, trimming up the white there with the eraser. I still was not happy with this part. <laughs> that, that part was the was the bane of my existence. Yeah, did you see that? Oh, that's that's horrible. Got a little scritchy scratch in there. Um, that happens. You just have to have that little I have that little silver eraser there to the left. Uh, that's just a tiny little eraser stick. You can pull the stuff up with that. Um, now I'm just kind of giving some whiskers, tightening all that up. The whiskers on there kind of push that face forward a little bit uh, because it almost like pushes the focus of, 
you know, like if you had a camera, give, gives that 3D look uh, where it pulls that part of the vision forward. Um, done. I liked it enough to sign it, so we're good. So that is the fox done with the Jerry's Jumbo Pencils on the Strathmore, um, the Strathmore craft paper that's 100% cotton. This was actually my favorite to work with, twofold. I am a Gorilla Nut, and I really enjoy working with charcoal pencils. Um, the biggest problem about a Gorilla, you'll notice as this goes along, is it looks like a cartoon for a while. <laughs> That's one of those things you just have to get over. Uh, there were parts of this drawing where I was just like, God, this is just going to look horrible. But it's just because it's not shaded. Um, I've drawn gorillas a lot at zoos. The North Carolina Zoo had some really wonderful gorillas and I was able to spend a lot of time there, kind of developed a relationship with them. Gorillas love to watch you draw. They find it fascinating and they want you to show them what you're doing. Um, and uh, they make kissy faces at you. <laughs> I've learned if they like what you've done. So uh, Carlos that was there always would chase everybody else away and sit next to the window so that I could draw them. So that's why I still have the love for these guys. Um, with this, you can see I'm going in and I've kind of crafted out the shape of the body, the shape of the face. Um, slowly I'm doing little additions with big, broad, streaming, sweeping strokes. You can see that's much bolder than uh, I've been doing with kind of those other pencil drawings. I like this loose. I like it very fast with this charcoal like this. Um, because they have a lot more hair on them than you realize when you really start looking at pictures, there's a lot of really long hair on there. You can really get away with uh, strokes that are a lot kind of wider and wilder than you can with a, a short-haired animal like a, a horse or a dog or a short-haired cat. Um, follow the contours. This is where kind of learning to follow contours and practicing that. Uh, even with just basic shapes really comes into play, you know, having that good skill set. Um, and it is a skill set because you're going to need to shade with those contours to make an animal like this look believable. Um, you can see on the face I'm doing, I'm still doing lines. That's not just kind of, you know, blending it along. I'm actually doing lines as I go. So this is little tiny fast lines where I'm, um, you know, putting that on that paper. This is Reeves BFK printmaking paper, but it takes charcoal wonderfully. It's one of my favorite uh, charcoal drawing papers. Um, it's very soft and it grabs the pencil in a kind of an odd way um, that I enjoy. I was going to do it at an angle like that and didn't like that. So uh, see how big sweeping strokes. I'm moving my whole arm as I do that. Uh, it just, it, it looks a little messy at first, but then when you kind of go back over it with, with other strokes, it starts kind of mixing in the viewer's eye going back into the face, tightening that up. Um, you can see with this, I work all over uh, this drawing. This drawing took about 20 minutes uh, in real life before it was sped up. Uh, so it's done very quickly. Um, see how that contour makes, makes all the difference. It makes that hair believable that it's standing up. Uh, this is a, a Pixabay image as well. So it's something that anybody can pull off pixabay.com. Um, and it's done. That, that was how easy that was. All right, this is going to be an elephant illustration. I'm using the create -A color graphite powder. Um, you want to sprinkle it out, not quite as liberal as it, liberally as I did. It kind of went everywhere. Um, I'm working in into the Reeves BFK printmaking paper. I really like that texture, so I use that a lot in drawings. Uh, just from having had a lot of it around in college for printmaking. Uh, what I'm doing here is working the graphite dust into the paper, into kind of the texture of the paper. Dusted a little bit of the excess off. Now I'm just trying to kind of get it as even as I can kind of worked into that paper um, with that goat hockey brush. The pencils that I'm using are the Faber-Castell graphite pencils. I really like those. Uh, it seems like all of the softness and hardness are, seem like they work really well. Uh, the paper holds it really nicely. Just did a very basic rough sketch with the elephant here. 
Now I'm going in with a slightly darker pencil for the eye. All right, now I've got a piece of chamois cloth. It's just a piece of kind of a rough leather uh, chamois. What I'm doing is that pulls that dust right off the page. I'm going through and roughing out kind of where I want those highlights to be on the elephant first because it pulls it, picks it up nice and clean, um, much cleaner than a kneaded eraser will for this part of what I want to do. So now that I'm kind of got to that point, now I've got actually the vanish eraser. I'm trying to pull out the highest highlights that I want with that. Just using kind of the edge, it's a rectangular eraser. It's got a nice sleeve so it doesn't kind of get, get me all icky with the graphite dust. And I'm basically using that as a drawing tool, I'm going in and doing the negative instead of the positive. You can see once in a while I'm grabbing that brush and kind of smoothing the graphite back in. Um, I'm gonna go along and kind of do all of the highlights with this. Um, the Just the work area is so large you don't really see the, the image, but I'm, I've got the image off to the side there. Again, just kind of smoothing that graphite back in there. Now I'm going back in with the pencil to start the darkest of the darks. Um, when I start this, I'm working with this, this set's the anniversary set. It's got some of the really large and the really, the normal size pencils. Um, when I'm gonna be working with that pencil, I believe it is a 4B that I'm going in with. Just to start kind of breaking in, getting in those darker darks. Um, so starting with the eye and I'm going to work out from there, kind of trying to get how I want my darkest darks to be so I know I've got the lights and the darks. Right there, the little silver handle tool, that's actually a stick eraser um, that Tombow makes. It's the round. I'm using that to get super, super defined. It's a very small uh, eraser point. Um, get the super defined uh, highlights pulled out from there. All right, now that I've kind of gotten my eraser lines pulled out, um, I'm going in and around the trunk trying to kind of define that kind of large shape with the pencil. Notice how quickly that just with that very basic outline suddenly that's very three-dimensional because we've got that kind of mid-tone gray value with the uh, graphite dust and then just that outline and then the eraser highlights really suddenly makes that form pop. Um, I'm working in kind of this small space here uh, kind of around the trunk just to kind of start really to find that curl of the trunk. Um, just that's it's such a complex form. It's very snake-like. It's kind of cool. It just takes a little more effort uh, with the highlights and the darks to really get that form to be believable. Um, just pay close attention to your drawing as you work along doing this. Anytime you're doing a drawing, especially of a person or an animal, if you can be looking at the drawing about 80% of the time that you're actually drawing, you will get, uh, you're paying a lot more attention to your source, so you're going to get a lot better results. It's going to look a lot more like the actual subject. Um, you can see with very little added here, it's it's got just, you know, the a little bit around the face and then, uh, you know, starting to kind of go into the background with the darker darks. That really starts becoming a lot more defined. Now I'm going in and starting the shadows around the ears. Um, the highlights on the ears I didn't initially like as much. It just kind of seemed, uh, I don't know, a little bit too cartoony. So I'm going to really play with once I kind of am getting this form in here where it's got that shadow, it's going to start popping that ear out. I'm going to start really working into that leg and up and around the ear, trying to kind of get that form a little bit better defined uh, so I can kind of decide what to do with it from there. The picture, the shadow of the leg was very strange so just kind of trying to find a way to um, make it define the leg when it didn't as much in the picture and uh, make it believable was somewhat difficult. Now see I'm not drawing every single little teeny tiny line I'm just trying to take some of those major forms uh, to define them just to kind of kind of let that in between help play off of the light and the dark so that the viewer actually in their subconscious kind of puts the animal together. A, a good illustration uh, drawing or painting really is going to have the viewer extrapolate from the information that you're giving them and kind of put it together in their head just as much as what you're actually offering in the form right there. 
All right, so we're back to defining this leg and kind of around the ear a little bit more. Since that ear pops out from the body, I really felt like I needed to pay a lot more attention to kind of getting those lights and darks fixed a little. You can see I'm kind of going over some of that part that I pulled out with the eraser where I wasn't happy with it, just to kind of try to make that 3D kind of the form of the folds in the ear really translate better um, in the artwork itself. Um, here I'm using a lot more broad kind of sweeping motions for the shadows. I like the energy that larger uh, brush strokes or uh, pencil marks really give. Um, it adds kind of, I guess, a little bit more movement to an immobile object since kind of the, the animal is frozen in time. Um, it adds more interest to the piece, I think, as well. Overall, it makes the eye kind of continue to travel around when you've got something like this that's a very, very basic uh, kind of straightforward composition. Sometimes those little bit of tricks in the line work can actually add more to it. Um, just uh, add to the interest. I'm starting to define the kind of the head and the face here. Um, you know, giving giving some wrinkles, but not all of them. You don't need to have every single thing in there. I really wanted to get kind of a much darker background so his head really popped out. Um, the one kind of drawback to the Reeves BFK with a lot of graphite and the powder, I'd not done it with graphite powder before like this, was there was only a point because it's a smoother paper where it wasn't holding as much of a pencil stroke. So it was kind of fighting with it to how much load it would actually be able to manage here. Um, continuing to kind of just offer some lines uh, here along the trunk to kind of further define that 3D effect. So further defining the trunk, um, just to kind of get a little bit more in there. Uh, I felt like it needed to be shaded just slightly more just to kind of have that fall away. Um, and again, just trying to see how much more of that pencil lead I can push onto that paper. And see how that forehead and that bottom of the trunk really stand out. Suddenly it's a very three dimensional. I'm kind of trying to somewhat up the back, but we don't want too much because we don't want that to be a focal point where it leads the viewer right off of the paper there. Again, just a slight bit more shading there up at the top. Um, and we are pretty much done. All right, so I am sketching in a cow. This cow is Amber Rose, one of our viewers from Facebook Live. Uh, her name is Tina Vanderbrook. Uh, she lives out in Wyoming and has been sending me pictures of this beautiful little cow since she was born and had to be bottle fed. So I enjoy the updates she sends uh, every day and I decided that Amber Rose needed to be part of our Fur and Feathers episode. So. Um, what I'm doing is just loosely sketching this in uh, of her. It is a 2H pencil. Uh, it's one of the Rafine pencils. It's just the first thing I grabbed I could find that was 2H. Um, the eyes I'm doing a little bit heavier. I generally tend to do very, very light sketching with this uh, because I want to leave enough pencil mark where I can see, but I don't want enough graphite where it's going to pick up uh, with the watercolor. So you'll see that I'm kind of sketching the fur as I go along, very rough, um, cleaning up any areas uh, with an eraser because I just don't want that extra graphite, those extra graphite lines. Uh, using the vanish eraser there, the little eraser to the, my right hand there is a stick eraser. That's one of the Tombow erasers that's very, very small. You can get very small lines um, and areas out with that. Um, this watercolor is going to be done with the Mission Gold, um, the My Hello Mission Gold Perfect Pan Set. If you've watched the show, you've probably seen it on there a number of times. It's just nice, bright colors. Uh, they mix very easily, uh, very nicely. Uh, it's just kind of a really good, as strange as it sounds, with the colors that are there, it's actually a really good palette for doing animals with. You would expect me to say that if there were a lot more um, kind of earth tones, but I use a lot of reds and blues in uh, the work while I'm working with watercolor, so uh, for fur, so you'll, you'll see that as we go along. 
So we've got the rough sketch pretty much laid in here. Um, the paper is the Arsha's cold press. Uh, it's a block, so it's not gonna lift up. It's 140 pound. Um, and I think it is the natural white. Uh, I've got Turner, the Turner uh, masking fluid right here. New masking fluid that we just started carrying at this time that I started this. Uh, we had just done a recent demo with it. I'd never used it on a work and it was there and I decided that kind of the proof in the pudding would be to see how it did with this. Um, usually I wouldn't want to do this if it was just a regular artwork, but you know, you, you gotta you gotta use it sometimes so I figured we'd see how well it did with this it actually performed quite fabulously this work had to get set aside for a number of weeks with other filming we had and just some other stuff uh, that came up we, we usually start these pretty early well a month or two in advance of the show um, even happening so it still is it comes up really easily surprisingly even after all this time usually I wouldn't not let that kind of stuff sit that long but I kind of had forgotten Forgot we used that masking fluid. Um, it applies really fantastically, nice and smooth. Dries pretty quickly so you can see it really easily. You can see it's kind of a little bit of a, a kind of a buff color, buff titanium almost color. Uh, it it comes right off. It doesn't leave any staining or anything like that. So um, it's it was very, very nice masking fluid. Probably the nicest stuff that I've ever used. Uh, I don't do a lot of watercolor, but I do mask stuff for other mediums, um, and it, it was great. So, um, using the um, the brushes that we've got that are for masking fluid that are very inexpensive, but keep a nice point. Um, right there was just putting some watercolor medium out. Uh, we've got some Da Vinci watercolor medium. I just add that a little bit sometimes just to kind of uh, control the wetting in the paper um, of certain colors. So. Uh, here, I'm going to be taking like a Payne's Gray, we're just kind of um, filling in, kind of getting that uh, shadow, kind of nice outline of the calf on the ground there, just so we can kind of find our form, see it easily, uh, to kind of start and work from there. Um, so we will fill in that and then kind of go from there. Now we're going to start kind of filling in some of the uh, nose very lightly. Uh, Obviously, you don't want to use a lot of white for the just it's not as opaque and uh, you know only so much is going to sit on the surface. So just kind of very, very light washes of pink to start that nose up. Um, I go in and go ahead and kind of start with some of the darker darks first, especially eyes or something like that on a cow, just so you can see kind of where they're at um, and get a good idea of. Um, Kind of how dark you want those darkest darks to be on something that's especially with a with a animal face that's white um to kind of know what values you're gonna have to work with in between uh that looked a lot greener than i expected so slowly it'll be browned down here over time but it, i wasn't that worried about it it's you can kind of fix that as you go uh, it's just a nice color for shadows so kind of trying to pick and pull some of the shadows out on the calf here while we're going along you can see that i'm kind of using the brush to go ahead and do some of the strokes that kind of just i guess suggest the hair you don't want to do every little you know stroke of hair especially in paint it starts looking too patterned a lot of people don't think to switch brush sizes if you're going to do that you need to be good about switching brush sizes switching strokes and everything else because otherwise it becomes very pattern and um, and it can do more harm than good in your artwork so I just usually just by kind of you know emphasizing some of the hair in some places um, suggesting it, it that leaves the viewer subconscious to kind of fill in the the mental blanks as to making that hair in kind of the back of their subconscious there um, just kind of putting in some color here looking for the lightest lights um, a lot of people only work just in that one section just without a formal any formal watercolor training since I was I think 14 I had a still life watercolor class it was probably the most boring thing I ever did but I think it was just the the instructor but um, it I wasn't really taught kind of how to do it so I used the lightest light paint that over everything so then if there's sections that some paint doesn't get on you at least have a color that kind of reflects back at you 
Um, so that's kind of what I tend to do for animals when I do the watercolor is just kind of across most of it. I'm going in with some darks, kind of trying to find and enhance the, uh, the ear there, start kind of building up the shapes of the hair, um, building up the light values. Uh, if you, I squint a lot when I'm working on it with artwork just because I believe in there being a lot more gray value variation. So if you squint right now, you really only see that big deep shadow and a little bit of the body. Uh, so as kind of as I'm working, I'll stop and I'll, I'll do that just to kind of see where my values lay. Um, brushes that we're using, we've got uh, the black ones that look like a squirrel brush are the um, Danube um, quill brushes. The, we've got um, a Mimic Kalinske, which is a synthetic Kalinske, and right now I'm using a, uh, the new Steinberg Kalinske brush to start kind of working on the face. All right, so I'm gonna start building some of the co uh, body color here. Um, that really kind of nice, kind of bright, kind of almost orange red that we're working with just to get some of those lighter lights that are kind of in the back of her little leg, kind of in the, the crook of her hock. Um, working on starting to build up some of those darker shadows for it. If you squint now, you can really start seeing a change in the gray values since we're filling in some of the body and it's got that nice shadow there. Um, so I'll start be working on those shadows in the body and kind of in the front. All right, so we're starting to go into the detail kind of in her nose and mouth and her face here. Um, kind of working the entire way around the body here and there just to kind of let some areas dry and then uh, be able to go back without always having to stop and use that hair dryer. Um, kind of slowly building up those values in the ears. I'm just tentatively, I don't want to overdo it, but I want to make sure that the values work well enough for it. Um, got the tag. If you know anything about cattle, which some people do and some people don't, with the mad cow disease problems, you have to have an ear tag now in one or both ears. Uh, it's state dependent. Some states make you have two, others don't. Uh, it's just a way to be able to keep track of stock. So that's something where if you're worried about making it look contemporary and now an ear tag obviously says that because they have to have it now. Um, bigger farms just have them so they know who's who and to, as far as to keep for genetic breeding purposes. Working on the eyes now and in her face. Um, you can see some of a cool, kind of a cool gray blue there before. With her face, I'm going to actually use some warm and cool colors just to be able to um, kind of, with that tonal value and the, the warm and cool, it's going to kind of add more life and livelihood to her. Uh, the face is just so plain otherwise, being an all white face, it just adds a lot more interest in the hair, kind of makes the curls look more actively curlier, if that makes any sense. Um, so we'll work on kind of that face there. You can see that it, I'm going right up and in some cases a little into some of that, uh, some of that masking fluid. You can see it kind of beating on the surface. Um, just to try to get some shadows on her face. If you squint some, you can start really seeing the gray values coming along in her face now. Um, kind of the trick of her nose, actually, it's hard to see in the picture, but has some little spots on it, which are very funny. So trying to get those little spots on her nose and freckles on her nose to make it look like her uh, were kind of intriguing. Uh, so kind of back to some of the detail around the eye, bringing up some of the color, some of the, around their eyes is a lot more pink if they've got that much white um, because it's pink skin underneath the white on the cattle. Darkening the eye, kind of trying to get a little bit darker darks up in the nostrils um, and then kind of soften them just so it's not just crazy dark. There we go, there go those spots. Now if you squint now, suddenly that uh, her face really comes forward. That gave it a really 3D effect. Uh, adding those spots kind of help round that nose out. Uh, now we're gonna go in, we're gonna put the, just kind of a, a nice grass so she's not floating in, in white in midair. We've got a nice kind of a colored ground there for her to lay on. I'm not really worried about making it look just like ground, just need a color for her to sit on. All right, so 
we're going to kind of do a just a Payne's gray background wash here just to start pulling her forward she really was blending in way too much to the background we're starting to kind of focus on her and not kind of just fill in some some negative space I was getting tired of seeing there so putting this part in just to kind of fill that in see I'm not bringing that all the way to the fur on her back kind of around her ear I like that little bit of play of kind of that raw paper um, and notice I'm not freaking out that this is kind of mixing together and it looks kind of weird there's enough water on there where it's gonna be fine for a minute I'll kind of go back in and blend it some um, to kind of smooth it out I don't I, I'm not worried about it being a you know perfectly fine wash there around her it, as it settles since that's a kind of a granulating pigment that's being used in the back there since it settles it'll kind of make some nice shapes on its own that I think look kind of a little bit more modern um, going back in kind of working on the eye touching up the eye kind of really starting to work some on the nose to pull that forward um, Now this is when we're starting in with kind of that warmer color that I was saying that I would I would do uh, a little bit of brown. There's a little bit of uh, some of the quinacridone magenta in there, um, just to kind of keep with the warm tone of her body, but to have a little bit of cool. There's some cool there. See how that kind of plays against each other? It's a nice kind of mix together. If you squint, that's really starting to make that face start taking kind of a, a three-dimensional form and shape and stand out. Um, so these colors look very, very dark uh, until they're dry. So as, as I'm kind of watching this back through, I'm adding, going, ah, that's way too dark. That's just what it does. If you're used to watercolor, you know, you already know that. If you're not, don't, don't despair. It's as it dries, it kind of softens out that look. Uh, which in some ways makes it, that's kind of my problem. I, I'm afraid to be a little bit more bold for fear that it will be overdone. Um, so just kind of touching up her ears, we're gonna work a little bit more in that shadow. That really pulls it forward. If you squint there, nice, nice and dark, really kind of lifts her head up and away from her body. Um, back into the ears, kind of playing with that dark, always kind of trying to match it up darkest dark still needs to be kind of her eyes in that shadow so if one gets a little darker I'm kind of matching it equally with the other all right so we're going to kind of label that tag we've got our background and everything in we're putting her tag number on there for her um, just so you can see that in the image it's always pretty easy to see on their little tags you can see it from far away I'm gonna kind of enhance the tag edge a little bit of a shadow so it looks more like it's in her ear darken her ear there if you if you squint now that gray value those ears getting dark and really pop her face forward um, it seems dark now as it dries it'll be a little bit lighter just kind of putting some final shadows in the ear pulling up that there was a little bit of masking fluid that was at their face that I didn't realize so I'm kind of trying to value that down slightly um, so that you can't see that and just kind of finishing her little nose there and some last shadows and the face looks pretty done kind of enhancing around her face um, if you want to see the entire image done check out that Facebook episode that we did with the fur and feathers um, the rest of the picture will be done but just kind of for this early filming state uh, we just wanted to kind of have a more detailed face done Going on with some blue around her now, just because that's a complementary color to that orange in her body. So it kind of, look how much that makes her head pop, just that complement, uh, really gives it a nice dynamic. Kind of just ghosting in some dirt there in the background. It doesn't have to be perfect, it doesn't have to look just like the picture. Um, it's kind of, I work the, the background color, some of the shadow around her. Um, squint now it's very very three-dimensional with that little face um, just kind of adding some dirt to kind of further push that value back bring her forward and uh, we're done <laughs>